All right, welcome back to the channel. It's Sam here with GSK Wealth Builders, and this is episode two of How to DeFi. We're gonna be covering the DeFi ecosystem. So just before I get started, um, episode one was a couple weeks ago, and it just covered what DeFi is. So this episode is gonna be covering the ecosystem and just the 10 most important parts that I see in DeFi right now. So let's get right into it. All right, so we're just gonna cover what we covered last time. So DeFi is a movement and the movement allows users to utilize financial services, borrowing, lending, saving, and trading without using any centralized entities or relying on any centralized entities. Why you would want to remove yourself from these entities as they've been known to pick and choose who they do business with. Um, they've had histories of discrimination. They don't always give you the best rates, right? It's in their best interest to, to make more commission or make more money. So you're going to be moving to decentralized entities, which uh, give you more, more equity. So these entities are, this service is provided by decentralized applications that run on the blockchains. The most common blockchain for DeFi right now is Ethereum and Binance chain. There will be others, um, Polkadot, Kusama, and uh, many more other blockchains and parachains, right? So normally the way DeFi works is when you're using the application, you're providing collateral to a platform to access the services that are in the smart contracts. So the DeFi ecosystem. So I'm just going to identify a few important categories. There's 10 that I've identified. Um, they're all dApps or applications, and they revolutionize financial services. Um, they, renew, they remove the need for middlemen. So they're very capital light. And DeFi in its current state, you have to know that it's highly immature and it's experimental and it's being improved daily. So there is risk when you're using it. And so DeFi hacks um, from 2019 until now have totaled $284 million US. So how decentralized is DeFi right now? So we just need to separate the degrees of decentralization. So one would be centralized, so it's custodial. So they have your coins, you send your coins to them. Um, they use centralized price feeds, they control the prices. So for example, Bitcoin price on Coinbase can be completely different than the Bitcoin price on Binance or Kraken, right? They control that. Um, they determine the interest rates based on the profitability of their platform and they centrally provide liquidity for margin calls. So examples of these platforms are BlockFi, Nexo, Celsius, um, there's others, Gemini, and, and many more, right? So also you would have to KYC and provide and abide by the rules of where they're operating it, right? So that's gonna be a challenge for some people. So then you have the next level, which would be semi-decentralized. So the characteristics of a semi-decentralized organization would be it's non-custodial, so you maintain the control of your coins. It decentralized price feeds using oracles, for example, Chainlink and other price feeds. Um, permissionless initiation of margin calls. So it's automated or someone else can margin call you if you're in the wrong um, zone of, of liquidity or equity. Decentralized interest rate determination. So the platform and the criteria programmed into the, the blockchain and the program are gonna determine the interest rates, decentralized platform development updates. So for example, if a platform needs to be updated, they're gonna vote. And the people holding the tokens and the coins with voting interest are gonna be able to vote on that, um, on that issue. So examples would be Compound, MakerDAO, Ethereum. So for example, the Ethereum 1559 um, update, they noticed the fees were too high. The gas fees on Ethereum, the fee to use the system was too high. So they voted on it and they came to a conclusion that we will, I guess they will start burning coins to reduce the supply in exchange that there be uh, less fees on, on the network. So that should keep the network strong. And then the last would be completely decentralized. So every single component of the 
DAP or the blockchain is decentralized. Right now, there's no DeFi protocol that's completely decentralized. Usually what happens is the DeFi protocol runs on a decentralized platform, for example, Ethereum, but the people programming the application and programming the protocol are centralized. Like it's a team, a dev team. So now we're gonna to move to the key DeFi categories. So the 10 categories of DeFi that I find important are stable coins, lending and borrowing, exchanges, derivatives, yeah, fund management, wallets, payment, insurance, staking, and lottery. So bare minimum, you're gonna need a wallet. And then you probably need a stable coin eventually. And then you'll probably need a cryptocurrency that you're going to be using on these blockchains. So, and then eventually, hopefully, all of these platforms have insurance. And then you're gonna be able to use those things. So we're gonna go over stable coins. So stable coins are used because crypto is volatile and they want to peg stable coins to the US dollar. For example, when volatility gets high and you're uncomfortable, instead of cashing out, you can cash out to a stable coin. So you have the US dollar, USDC, Gemini, Paxos, TrueUSD, Tether, you have um, LUSD, there's so many versions of uh, and DAI. So there's so many versions. So stable coins, you know, cryptocurrencies are extremely volatile. Stable assets such as USDC were created. So Tether was the one of the first stable coins. And what they pitched was every single UST is supposedly backed by $1 in the issuer's bank account. So Tether had a, an American bank account, making it legit. And every dollar of Tether was supposedly backed by the bank account. However, the downside is you have to trust them. Now, how do you how do you have access to your bank account? You don't, right? Because it's centralized. There's some privacy there, so you need to trust that Tether is telling the truth. Decentralized stable coins solve this problem by minting the coins or the U.S. dollars collateralized by other assets. So, for example, you could put some Ethereum, and fifty percent of that Ethereum collateral becomes minted as a USD coin or USC coin. So that's what the um, the premise of it premise of it is. So they operate fully on decentralized ledgers. They're governed by a decentralized autonomous organization. So they lead by consensus and voting and the reserves can be publicly audited by anyone because it's open source. It can also be forks or copied by someone else and improved. So that's a good, um, that's a good benefit. So lending and borrowing. So there's 1.7 pe billion people currently unbanked. Most of those people, around 60% of them, do have a cell phone. So they would be able to um, access these platforms just through their phone. So restrictions to lending and borrowing have always been, you have to have a credit score, you have to have a down payment usually, you have to have a good income and a stable job. So for example, if you're a contractor and your income is not typical, then it might hamper your ability to borrow or your credit rate, or your interest rate. So decentralized lending and borrowing remove this barrier, allowing anyone to collateralize their digital assets and use this to obtain loans. <clears throat> so you put your, Bitcoin up or you put your Ethereum up and then you can get a loan in dollars and you can purchase a car and you can pay um, no interest and it's a 0.5% lending fee for that and then there would be no no terms. You create the terms. So you can also earn yield on your assets by contributing to the pool where they lend from and earning interest on those assets. So for example, you put up your coins for other people to borrow and you earn interest on your coins. There's no need for a bank account. There's no need for identification. There's no need for a credit worthiness check and interest rates range. They're typically between um, five and 8%, but they actually range from one to 20% depending on how much collateral. So for example, Celsius, you can put in collateral and at 30% uh, loan to value, you can get a 1% interest loan. So that's a good uh, good thing to have. And then what the benefit of that is you don't have to sell your coin, coins to spend money. You can actually borrow against your coins. And obviously loans are tax-free. So you pay 0% interest and then with liquidity, 0.5% fee on the volume. So for example, with liquidity, 
Uh, Justin Sun, CEO of Tron, he put something in like $1.8 million worth of Ethereum and he took out an $899,000 loan. And he only had to pay 0.5%. And that money, you know, it's basically free money. So this is what a platform, so Aave is one of the platforms that you can go in there. So this is the Aave platform. So you can see there's the different stable coins and you can see here what the deposit rate is. So you can earn 4% interest um, on the stable coin and then there's a variable borrow rate. So you can borrow at 6%, 2%, 1.44%. So then you go there. So what you would do is you'd have a wallet already, right? So you would connect your wallet, for example, your ledger, you'd click connect and then it would ask you to type in a password. You'd sign a transaction in the wallet to get access to your wallet. Now that you're inside of the wallet, what's gonna show is your wallet balances. So for example, this $999, right? And what you're gonna do is you're gonna deposit from your wallet into the smart contract on Aave. That's how they can hold or collateralize your assets. So you go, how, how much would you like to deposit? You click 100%. It's showing here what the interest rate is, so it's not that great uh, right now, but then you can do a loan. So then you approve it, you deposit it, then your balance is right there and it shows the APY. And then what you can do, you can use it as collateral and you can get a loan. Now, I don't know why you would put in dollars and then get a loan against dollars, but it would be good to put in ETH or Bitcoin and get a loan against that, right? So now you go and you select your interest rate. So if you want a stable interest rate, that is fixed, 8%. If you want a variable moving up and down um, and you can risk it going over that, you can do 6.25% and, and uh, bet. So then you get the interest. So this person is taking a 500 die and they just hit submit. And then the $500 is gonna go right to their wallet and they can spend it or use it as they please. So the next category of DeFi apps would be exchanges. So for trading, for brokeraging. So Coinbase, Binance, Coinsquare, Crypto.com, Bittrex, Gemini. These are intermediaries and custodians. So they hold your coins. So the users do not have full control of their assets. And you put your assets at risk um, in the case that the exchange gets hacked or they're unable to repay their obligations. The main way... However, they are the main way to go from fiat currency to cryptocurrency. It's very hard to go on a decentralized exchange and have dollars in your bank account or on your credit card and actually turn it into crypto. So most people have an account with a centralized exchange. They deposit their currency into this centralized exchange. They purchase crypto and then they'll withdraw to their wallet, which is decentralized and then they'll start operating um, that way. The other way you can get cryptocurrency is peer to peer. So maybe someone has millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin and he wants cash to pay his rent or something else like that. Well, you can go to them and you can buy their Bitcoin off of them and you can do the transaction peer to peer and uh, just do it on your phones or do it on your laptop. So decentralized exchanges, so a, a downside of a centralized exchange is you have to KYC. So you have to send them your passport picture. Usually they're, you take your phone and you have to scan your face and like move around and you got to wait three days when you want your money. They tell you, you know, you got to wait 12 hours for your money. There's all these different uh, hoops that you have to jump through, but it's the regulations that they have to operate by right now. When you go to a decentralized exchange, they solve this problem by allowing users to exchange cryptocurrency. So you have one person here, one person here, and a contract in the middle, and you can exchange the cryptocurrency uh, without giving up custody. So you don't have to trust the other person in a centralized exchange, the platform does it for you. So because you're not storing any funds on the, central, uh, on the uh, centralized exchange, you don't need to trust the exchanges will stay solvent because remember the coins are always in your wallet and not on the exchange. Um, there's no KYC necessary. You can open a wallet in, in you know minutes. So this is an example of a decentralized exchange called Uniswap. It's 80% of volume in crypto. Um, at one point was on Uniswap. I'm not sure what the percentage now is, but Uniswap is 
the number one Ethereum exchange is automated. So here you would go to swap and you can see you'd go to Ethereum, you put one Ethereum and then you would get uh, the die. So I think that's 174 die. That's what the price was at the time. So then you hit swap, a button comes up and it's going to pop up showing uh, how much that transaction costs. So Uniswap, it has high transaction fees. So probably between 20 and $60 to do a trade. So Ethereum blockchain is for people with a lot of capital, right? You don't want to have $100 and try to do Uniswap. Now, PancakeSwap is on the Binance Smart Chain, and it is a fork of Ethereum. So what they did was they took the open source code of Ethereum, they copied it onto the Binance Smart Chain, and they made their own, and they centralized it. So, but they did make it cheaper. So the fees to swap a coin on Binance Smart Chain is between 12 cents and 60 cents right so that is a, an, a lot different so the same thing it looks exactly the same just a little bit different color so you go from binance coin to say us dollars you put it here you hit unlock wallet then you're going to sign it then you're going to hit do transaction it's going to say it costs 60 cents it's going to swap it and on uniswap it's going to be maybe five two minutes to 15 minutes to swap a coin depending on your gas binance 10 seconds or less then you have one inch exchange so one inch exchange so the problem with these exchanges is there's not a lot enough liquidity sometimes and you have a lot of slippage so what one inch exchange does is every time a new exchange is created they add the liquidity of those exchanges to their aggregator so now you can go from eth to die and you can pull from multiple liquidity providers and have less slippage and you pay one gas price so the next category is derivatives so uh, derivatives obviously are derived from another asset for example stocks commodities currencies and indexes so there's a crypto index for example DeFi protocols so you could just buy the DeFi 10 protocol and it would hold a amount of all of the top 10 DeFi protocols so that you could go that way instead of having to pick and you can diversify coinbase trades stocks so you have mirrored version of stocks for example tesla the coinbase or no not coinbase uh binance can trade stocks so they have tesla they have binance i think they have microsoft and they have another one coming up so eventually you're going to have copies of stocks so for example you could be holding 45 binance coins and you want to switch to tesla because you think the crypto market is going to crash and tesla is going to go up and you can just swap it so that's pretty cool. So traders can use derivatives to hedge their positions or their risk. You can buy futures on these exchanges. You can do leverage tokens. So a 3X leveraged Doge token is available on Binance. Derivatives are mainly traded on centralized platforms. There haven't been DeFi platforms um, actively doing this yet, but they are starting to build them. Anything in centralized platforms, the decentralized platforms want to do it. Now, fund management. Fund management is really simple with crypto because you can just tokenize a fund. So for example, an index or an NFT collection, or you can tokenize a building, an apartment building. So there's a B20, there's a token called the B20 token. And Beeple is a highly valued artist. And what they did was they did a token raise. There's 10 million tokens, I believe, printed. And you could buy a token for like a dollar at the time. And it was as high as $40 per token because of the value of the art or the nfts keeps going up and down and so you just hold these tokens in your wallet and you can sell them on uniswap anytime you want and cash out um, DeFi projects for passive indexes so the crypto 20 index was one of the first indexes in 2017 i invested it in uh, the original ico and i sold it like a few months later and it had gone up i think quite a bit um, the transparency of DeFi makes it easy for users to track their funds, how it's being managed, and understand what the costs are they're paying. They always show you what your fees are when you're paying. So this is an example of a platform. It's called ORN, and it's not fully uh, up, good to go yet, but you have the trading, you have the wallet, you have your balances, you can buy and sell, and that's what it's going to look like. And then here's one called Oxygen, and this one is funded by the big banks, centralized places they're trying to you know get into DeFi, and so yeah oxygen you can trade with them as well but it's brand new so they're not they're still in testing
So wallets, you need a wallet to access the blockchain. So your wallet controls your private keys to the blockchain. So a wallet is not a physical item. It's a software program holding and trading crypto. The wallets contain a private key for security. And so you can memorize the backup for the private key, or you can write it down somewhere, but you should not store it uh, online. So the key corresponds to the address of the wallet, and there's four types of wallets. So you have a desktop wallet you can download on your laptop, the mobile wallet, a web wallet that's online, hardware wallet. And yes, you should memorize and save the backup just in case. There's actually a case of a guy who had Bitcoin and he went to jail and they, you know, they took his laptop and everything like that, but they didn't have the private key. So he has $40 million worth of Bitcoin. He's in jail for seven years and they keep asking him to tell them, you know, tell, tell them the codes. And he's like, I don't know the codes. So they can't access um, the coins. So this is what a wallet looks like, right? So you're going to have the app log in. It's going to show your total then it's going to show your holdings, right? And then also it's going to show your rewards that you can do if you stake and staking just means earning interest, locking up your coins to earn interest. And then you can choose a type of wallet, a cloud wallet, an HD wallet. That's for that. <clears throat> that's for that program. So the next category is payments. So with payments, uh, a key role for cryptocurrency is to allow peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Um, one project, so peer-to-peer -peer transactions are common, but one project that's cool is allows you to stream your income. So imagine your boss paid you by the second. So instead of waiting two weeks for your paycheck, every second you're earning. Or imagine that you were paying to go to the gym and you could pay as you go. So for example, the second that you enter the gym, it starts paying, you know, whatever per second. And the second you leave the gym, it stops paying. Or it could be for using a car. So um, the company is called Sibilier, I think, and they stream money. So it's every second. So this is just a, a cool way of, of changing payments. Sablier, I think. So it's showing this person is earning and you know 17 hours and 28 minutes remaining of them streaming, and that was how they'll get their payment. So your payments are in real time. I think that's just it's a cool idea. I don't know what I would personally use it for, but uh, it's a cool idea. Insurance. So obviously, insurance is a risk managed strategy a risk management strategy in which you receive financial protection on the platforms um, in case of hacks. So smart contracts are potentially vulnerable to exploits due to large uh, potential payouts. So for example, if a platform like Aave has $6 billion of coins, there's going to be hackers trying to get that $6 billion. So what you can do is now you can go to Nexus Mutual and get an insurance in case they get hacked. So you'll never know if a smart contract is truly safe because every day someone's trying to hack it. And there's always a possibility of a hack which can result in loss of your funds. So this is Nexus Mutual. So you would take the smart contract address and then you would say how much you want to cover and then it would charge you a fixed fee to cover you for say eight months. So staking. Staking is one of my favorite things in, in crypto. So proof of stake is a consensus algorithm. Um, randomly selected validators who stake the native tokens by locking them up into the blockchain, they produce and they approve the blocks. The validators are rewarded for their work based on their total stake. So for example, if you're staking 20% of the coins, you earn 20% of the rewards. And it incentivizes nodes to validate the network um, based on an ROI that they put out. So for example, they could say the ROI for staking uh, on our platform is 7%, and anyone who wanted to earn 7% uh, can become a validator. So Ethereum, for example, um, Ethereum has 117 million coins in circulation, and 27.3 million Ethereum are currently staked, and the rate of return right now is posted at around 7%. And that's $77 billion staked on the Ethereum platform for the next 18 months, possibly. That's 23% of the total supply. So the daily transaction fees um, being made by the miners and stakers is $9 million a day as of you know last week. And soon they're going to be burning that daily, which will reduce the supply of Ethereum. So the current supply is 117 million ETH. And the fee burn of the $9 million a day should turn should bring the total supply of ETH to $100 million 
uh, over a 12 year period. However, the amount of users on the Ethereum uh, blockchain are going up, so it could be actually a lot faster. So this is just a graph of what a typical event staking any coin it will start really high at the beginning because they reward first movers to stake right away because they could get hacked, whatever, right? And as more and more people stake millions of coins, the ROI goes down. So that's why you'll sometimes see, um, you know, staking like at 100, 200% because you're the first one in. So Lido Stake ETH, they are providing a service for people who don't have 32 Ethereum to stake because to stake on Ethereum, you need to put up 32 coins. At what three thousand dollars a coin so um 257 people they've combined with lido stake eth and then they stake it for you and the current apr they're paying a 7.1 percent so this is pancake swap so pancake swap you can stake tokens in the pancake swap um, ecosystem on their website right and they're currently paying 147 percent. so just like that curve it's going to start high and it's going to go down as more people stake and so uh, one thing is if it's automatically staked that's what the apr is 90 percent. and then if you reinvest the profits <clears throat> automatically it actually increases your your apr so at the beginning they didn't do that and then when pancake bunny came out and started doing it they copied pancake bunny so pancake bunny what they do is to promote you uh, to use their platform is they pay you the APR, for example, this 90% that PancakeSwap is paying, and then they pay you in their native tokens, the bunny tokens. And they're probably going to do this for the first six to eight months to encourage people to use the platform because you're scared, right? You're scared to use the platform. You don't know. I don't know who this audit company is, right? So that's what you do. And yeah, so 472% first movers advantage. It doesn't last like that for a year. It keeps going down over time, but this is a good way to stake your coins. If you believe in a project and you're gonna be holding the coins for a long time, why not stake your coins and earn interest? Auto Farm. Auto Farm is the exact same idea. Um, they're more transparent with their fees or they just show their fees there, right? So for example, um, they're gonna give you um, 121 percent and then they're going to give you farm tokens right as bonuses and then the fees so 0.2 percent profits go to the controller 0.5 percent on profits go to the platform an auto buyback rate 1.5 percent of profits so that means that there 1.5 percent of the profits are going to be um, burning the coin and then an entrance fee so coin burning, this is just a record of what Binance has been doing, right? So every quarter Binance burns tokens. I just wanted to put that up to show what a, a token burn does, right? So for example, every quarter they're, they're buying tokens and burning and then they're reducing the supply. So they reduce the supply by a million and they reduce the supply by 1.8 million and they reduce the supply by 2.2. So by the 14th burn, they're reducing the supply by 3.6 million BNB. So... 161 65 million dollars was burned last quarter so how are these rates paid the way that it's set up is when you raise money to do a project you put aside say half of the funding to pay people to use the platform so that's how these rates are so high so it rewards the first movers because they're risking getting hacked or losing their coins right mega bonuses are airdropped to promote adoption the inflation needs to be corrected though because you're inflating the coins by printing new coins so eventually what they do is they burn the coins uh, with the profits used and as the as the usage goes up there's more profits of fees right and then the fees collected are used to buy and burn the coins you want to check if the team is holding their tokens or if the tokens are locked for example are they locked for two years are they locked for three years if they are it's in the best interest um, to burn the coin because they're holding their wealth is held in the coins rates over 20 percent are not sustainable for over a year i don't think it's a bonus but you know 12 to 20 percent is the sweet spot so on the pancake bunny platform it shows today they have 7.3 billion dollars locked right the market cap of the token is 400 million and the profits that they've delivered is 79 million dollars so that's like bonuses coin burns all of that that's the profits that they've delivered for people that hold that native token 
And the last but not least is the lottery. So what the lottery, it's a no loss lottery, it's called pool together. And what they do is they pool capital in a smart contract on the blockchain because some people might not have a lot of money to, to use. They like to they gamble, right? So what they'll do is they'll pool it, say 100,000 people all pool their money together. Then they stake that on one of these platforms, right? Maybe they're earning 400%, but it's only for a week, right? So maybe they earn 2% for the week. So then what happens is the pooled capital is gone into this lending platform, the interest is earned, and it's given to one random winner at a set interval. So now you have a lottery ticket in, and all of a sudden you win $10,000, right? Everyone else who loses, they get their tickets back, they get their coins back. So it's a no-loss lottery. What you've lost is your individual staking rewards, the, you know, the 10 cents or 20 cents you would have made in a week. So this is a really cool way uh, to play the lottery and that that wraps it up so that is how to defy part two the defy ecosystem and i hope you i hope you enjoyed uh, this lesson i found it one of my favorite i found it one of my favorite uh, parts of defy is just going through all the different platforms every day i look for a new platform and you know this this thing excites me so uh, I love using new DeFi platforms. You know, you can't put too much capital in them because it's it's still risky. But over time, there's going to be some amazing uh, innovations. There are very smart people leaving finance to go into DeFi. There's very smart programmers going into DeFi, mathematicians. There are going to be some revolutionary uh, things going on. For example, I love the Terra blockchain. What they're doing, you can get 20% uh, annual fixed on your money. So if you have a, a solid, you know, pension fund or something like that, you can just put 20% and earn 20%. So um, that's a, that's the end of the show and stay tuned. There's going to be more. And I add content weekly, follow me on Instagram, turn your notifications on. And that's all I have for today. Take care.